All right, we're in the series that we're calling The Kingdom of God, the Gospel of Luke, and we have been looking at for a few weeks now this matter of what the kingdom of God is all about. Jesus Christ came into history introducing this idea of the kingdom of God. It's something that is yet to come, certainly in eternity, but it is something that he said is here right now. And he wanted to provide instruction in how we are to live it out. And the Gospel of Luke goes a long way towards doing that. Today we're at Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14 covers a lot of territory, but it's centered around one event. It's centered around Jesus coming to a dinner party. Now, it's kind of interesting to me to kind of look at the big sweep of Luke 14 and and just look at what it looked like for Jesus to come to a dinner party. What would happen if you invited Jesus to dinner? Well, what we see from the get-go, first part of the chapter, first he breaks the taboos that were present, the religious taboos, and he heals somebody even though it's the t- Sabbath, so that sets things off to a bad start. And then, and then what does he do? Then he insults all of the guests that are there, all the guests. He tells them that they're prideful jerks because they're picking up seats of honor. And then, to top it off, he then insults the host because he says, you invited the wrong people to the party. And then, if that wasn't enough, he says, and you're all going to hell, by the way. I mean, that's Jesus at a dinner party. So what we're going to do today is back up and and hone in on one particular part of it. Because what we see here is Jesus doing what he, he does all through Luke. He's teaching lessons in parables. He uses parables, these, these stories that typically lay out, here in Luke, lay out uh, what you might call the code of conduct for the kingdom. The code of conduct for the kingdom. A lot of them that come into play here. But there's one in particular <clears throat> that we're going to be looking at today, focusing in on one, in Luke chapter 14, verses 7 to 15. Let's look at that, beginning in verse 7. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place. So that when your host comes, he'll say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you'll be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Remember that verse. Going on to verse 12, though. Then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. What we're looking at here as part of the code of conduct of the kingdom is one word, humility, because that's what this parable is really all about. It hits humility from a couple of three different angles, but this is really the focus of, of what's going on here. Let's look at Luke 14, 11 again, that one verse. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. I mean, pretty much what Jesus is saying here is you have a choice you can choose humility yourself, or you can choose to be humiliated. Now, I've actually said that before, and I've gotten some kickback from it. And people say, you think God humiliates people? And my answer is, absolutely. I mean, that's what Jesus said here. He's, he can't say it too much more clearly than that. I mean, this is the idea that we have the ability to choose to put on humility, or the discipline of God comes in to shape us up in, in that in that area. Humility, as we look at it, is a big deal in, in the Bible. I mean, Old Testament and New, we see this, this idea of humility, the need for humility repeated over and over again, and it's, it's brought home in strong terms. Now, let me just give you an overview of where we're going today. We're going to look at some basics about humility. We're going to look at a couple of examples. We're going to look at how humility can help us out in a couple of big areas, big areas where we struggle. And then we're going to conclude with some habits of humility that we need to develop. Now, I'm telling you that in advance because I want you to do this for me. 
even if you tune out for the next 20 minutes looking at the basics, tune back in real quickly when we start talking about the habits of humility to develop. Because what we're talking about is something that can be a true key, a true key to becoming the person God wants you and me to be. See, there's this really strange thing that's going on here in Luke. Read through it again and see if you pick it up. The idea is, Jesus is saying, humility is something that we can choose. Humility is something we do. Humility is not just a feeling. It's not just the way we think. But it's something we do. It's something we choose. But then, but then, ironically, counterintuitively, he goes on and he tells us why we should choose it. Choose humility so that you can be exalted. Now, do you see the irony? <laughs> we're to choose, we're, we're to, choose to, to be humble ourselves so that God in his timing can, can exalt us. He says, the road, the path to greatness is by humility. And so hold on to that again as we get towards the end with these habits of humility because the habits that we're going to be looking at are all biblically based and they are things that we need to consciously, intentionally put in place in order to pursue the destinies that God has for us. Humility is something that is not easy, but it is intentional. That's what Jesus is saying here. That's what we see as we look through the entirety of Scripture. It's not something that's easy. It's not something that simply comes by osmosis. It's not something that we ask somebody to pray for us, to give us. It's something that we intentionally make choices and do. So let's, let's proceed from, from, from there. We want to go into this and look at the idea that it's a process, that, <laughs> that you never arrive at humility. You, you're never going to get to the point where you go, wow, I'm glad I'm through that pride stuff. I'm glad that I'm finally, finally at the finish line. I've arrived. I am humble. It doesn't work that way. It's an ongoing process. It continues on. It continues to be something in which we, we need to grow. Fun fact. Did you know, did you know that humility and gentleness are the only two character qualifications that Jesus Christ used to describe himself? The only two character qualifications Jesus used in the gospel to describe himself, humility and gentleness. Again, goes a long way. And we're told Jesus chose humility. He chose humility. He chose to go through the actions of humility, just like we're encouraged to do. Now, this matter of, of humility <clears throat> is a, a kingdom culture thing that we want to pick up. It's big in terms of what a kingdom culture looks like, that, that matter of, of choosing humility, but it's countercultural in terms of the world's cu culture. I mean, the world's culture is not at all about humility. I mean, you can see that from the weekly feeds you get from the political realm, right? There's no humility on either side of the aisle. It's not about humility. It, the world is about pride. Now, the world doesn't throw it out as pride is something we're supposed to grab hold of. It throws it as self-esteem. We're supposed to be big on self-esteem. Well, you know, again, this is not where humility takes us, really. Not to self-esteem, not, not in the way the world means it. The world is really screwed up in terms of this whole matter of, of what's important. Interesting fact, 2015, 2015, more people died taking selfies than from shark attacks. Bet you didn't know that, right? <clears throat> I mean, can you imagine, really? I mean, more people died taking pictures of themselves than were killed by sharks. What's going on with that? Well, a lack of humility, obviously, is part of what's going on with that as we're trying to commemorate everything that we have done or, or might possibly do. It's this idea of understanding that it really is a battle. It's a battle against the flesh. It's a battle against the enemy. It's a battle against pride. Pride is something that, that has been around since before Adam and Eve ate that first fruit in the Garden of Eden. Pride is what got Satan kicked out of heaven, it says in Isaiah, in the first place. Um, Saint Augustine, uh, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, said that, that pride is like the mother who's pregnant with all other sins. 
the mother who's pregnant with all other sins. I mean, that's pretty visceral in terms of seeing what pride is like. That, that all other sins flow out of this, this womb of pride that, that comes out in so many different ways with lying, with, with well, it goes on. You know the list. It's, it's just without number. Humility. Humility is something that comes with a lot of different definitions depending on the circumstances in which you find yourself. But I think one important way to look at humility is that humility is knowing your place. Not, not where you want to be, but where you ought to be. Humility is connected with, with a contentment, really. A contentment in who God has made you to be. A contentment that, that doesn't stay passive. A contentment that, that at the same time has ambition, but a contentment that has an ambition that's geared towards how God has put you together. This, again, is, is part of what what's involved with humility. Now, what I want to do, as I said, is look at how humility is described in other parts of Scripture, where it goes a bit more in-depth. I'd like to look, uh, for example, at 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 to 7. Now, again, who wrote 1 Peter? Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, but the same Peter who was back there watching Jesus as Jesus gave these parables, as Jesus told these stories about how humility is to be part of the code of conduct of the kingdom, this same Peter that, that, that lived out the battle with pride is in writing about it here in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 to 7. Let's look at that and then break it down a little bit. 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning in verse 5, Peter says... In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. Amen. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. You know, it's a really compelling verse. As you look at this, a really compelling uh, section of Scripture because what it does is it it first lays out, you know, the threat. You know, do you want to continue in pride? In which case, you're doing what? You're picking a fight with God is what he's saying. You want to continue in pride? You're simply picking a fight with God. Do you want God in opposition to you? Fine, continue on with your pride. Or, Or choose humility, in which case, what happens? The favor the favor of God begins to flow. The favor of God begins to flow. Again, humility is is accepting our place. Humility is a contentment that comes in in understanding how God has put us together. Humility is about God's glory and not ours, but humility is not about is not about giving up all ambition altogether. It's not about forgetting the things that God has put you here for. And again, I'm jumping back to Jesus as I think about this, because think about Jesus, okay? Jesus clothed himself with humility. He chose humility. He saw humility as one of his primary character traits, one of the big two for him. But, but what do we see with Jesus? What did Peter see with Jesus? A guy who was all about the mission that he was on. A guy who had ambition to fulfill the mission he was on. A guy who had ambition to defeat the works of the devil. A guy who was, not, who was not simply laying around waiting for stuff to happen, but he moved forward with power. And the way he did it was called humility. It's got a lot to do with where our head is, though. And we need to contrast this matter of pride and humility, I think, just in basic terms. Pride, first of all, is a natural thing. Pride is something we're born with. Pride is something you didn't have to teach your kids how to pick up. It just comes naturally. Humility, on the other hand, is is supernatural. It is something that's chosen. It is something that's learned. It's not the default. Pride is something that covets other people's success. Humility is something that celebrates other people's success. Pride is selfish at its core. Humility is being a servant, serving the needs of others and putting them before you, it says in Philippians chapter 2. Pride is about getting glory. Humility is about giving glory. Pride is about independence. Humility is about dependence. Pride is about being easily offended. Humility is about being able to become unoffendable. In verse 6, 1 Peter chapter 5, we see again this, this 
admonition to humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. That's what it says. Let's put that verse up again. Verse 6, chapter 5 of 1 Peter. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. And what's going on? Well, again, the context, Peter is the one that's speaking. So what did, what was Peter what was Peter thinking? Well, I, I think two or three things come into play in terms of Peter's thoughts, in terms of what the Holy Spirit wanted to get across and what he wants to get across to us. What, what, what is the stuff about the hand of God? What, what is he talking about? Well, I think what he's talking about and what Scripture is trying to get across to us is the hand of God represents a couple of three different things. The hand of God represents, number one, the plan of God, that we we humble ourselves under the hand of God and that we humble ourselves under his plan. We, we believe, it's trusting that God actually does have a plan for his universe, but also a plan for your life, a plan for your life, which gives us the upper hand in any situation that we're in. It's understanding that when we know that God has a plan, we understand and believe that he's gonna guide us, that he's going to make a way for us when there doesn't look like there's any way to be made. I mean, this is what... Again, Peter saw as he thought back to, to what it looked like to walk with Jesus those three years that they walked together. The plan of God. N- number two, the hand of God there represents the provision of God. The provision of God. Again, humbling ourselves under the hand of God means we humble ourselves knowing that he's got a plan. We humble ourselves not getting all bent out of shape, all worried knowing that he makes provision for us. Peter's looking at the idea that, you know, some kid comes in with loaves and fishes and Jesus feeds 5,000. He understands that there's going to be the provision that's made that's necessary when God needs to make that provision to see us fulfill the purposes that he has for us. Humbling ourselves under the hand of God means that we believe that God has a plan, that God is going to make provision. And then third, humbling ourselves under the hand of God means that we believe that God is going to provide protection, protection for us. He has me in his grip of grace. I think maybe Peter could have been thinking at that point about when he got out of the boat trying to walk on the sea, Sea of Galilee, and he starts sinking, and that grip of grace came down and grabbed hold of him as Jesus grabbed his hand, that the protection comes in, that when we fail, when we fall, when we're walking in his plan, the protection still comes into play. The provision still comes into play. The plan is still something that God wants to see worked out. All of this can be actually put under that one theological term, sovereignty. It's trusting. It's believing the sovereignty of God, that he does have a plan, that he does step in and make provision, that he will come in and provide protection. No, it doesn't mean that bad things never happen. No, it doesn't mean that people don't die, but it does mean that the plan is going to be carried out as you stay on the path towards the purpose that he has for you. It does mean that the provision, the protection are going to be there as you complete the purposes that he has for you and me. And it means that at some point, the purposes we have are going to be completed. And then, what's the bad news? We go to heaven. That's not such bad news, right? So this is, this is what, what he's laying out here in terms of humbling ourselves, humbling ourselves under the mighty hand of God is a matter of surrender. It's a matter of surrendering our plan. It's a matter of surrendering the sense that we have got to make the provision all the time for ourselves. It's humbling and, and presenting ourselves with the idea that no, we cannot provide all the protection that needs to be provided. It's trusting the sovereignty of God. Yes, it's taking action. Yes, it's not being stupid. Yes, it's taking the steps that we need to take as God gives us the direction, but it's about surrendering in faith to the things that he wants to accomplish in us. So what he says here, he says that in humility, in humility, verse seven, then cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Now, this is a little section here, verses 6 and 7, that, that's really interesting. Because what we do with Scripture, right here, is we take out verse 7 as one of those verses we like to, to memorize, maybe put it on the refrigerator. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And, and maybe you've tried that. And then you, you found out it doesn't always work. I've cast all my anxiety on, on him, and then it jumps right back on me again. I mean, I keep trying to cast it, and it jumps back on me again. It's like I'm a magnet, you know, and the, the, the anxiety keeps coming back, coming back, coming back. Well, <clears throat> again, a text out of context is a pretext. And what we do here is we take the text without understanding that verse 7 
requires verse 6 to have first occurred. What does verse 6 say again? Verse 6 must come before verse 7 because we must first humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. We've got to humble ourselves under the mighty hand, humbling ourselves and surrendering to God's protection, God's provision, and God's plan, and then cast the anxiety on him. It's not going to jump back on us so quick. That's the idea. As we have humbled ourselves in the right way, then we can cast the anxiety, and we see one of the great side benefits of humility as being able to walk through life free from the anxiety. But, but it's kind of the, the secret process that, that has to be has to be gone through. I mean, if we continue to insist on our plan, on our provision, on our protection, what happens? Well, what happens is you feel like you've got the weight of the world on your shoulders. Because you do. And we're not made to support the weight of the world on our shoulders. It's the idea that it's his plan, his protection, his provision, and the humility to say, I can't do it, only you can do it, God. Humility, again, is, is a matter of, of really just faith. It's boiling down to, ultimately, I believe you, God. I believe you're good. I believe your promises are true. I believe you do have a plan. I believe you will protect. I believe you will provide. I'm going to humble myself by choosing to believe these things. I'm going to humble myself by choosing to believe these things, even when it's strange. I'm going to believe these things even when it insults my intelligence. I'm going to believe these things and do these things even when it seems strange. I mean, I've told you before, as followers of Jesus, we're not supposed to be weird, but we are supposed to be very strange people. And this is how we walk it out. The strangeness of believing things that seem counterintuitive to pursuing greatness, which we are admonished by Jesus to pursue. Pursue greatness, be humble. Be humble and get on the path towards greatness. This is how we do it. By believing things that seem strange because we have the humility of mind to say, I don't know how this works, God does. Old Testament illustration, probably overused, but it's in the Bible, so we're going to use it again. It's Naaman, Naaman, the Syrian general, in 2 Kings chapter 5. He's got leprosy. He hears of the great prophet Elisha, who's a miracle worker in Israel, and so he goes to see Elisha to get healed of his leprosy. And then what happens when he gets to Elisha's um, abode? Well, Elisha won't give him a personal audience. So immediately, Naaman is offended. He's offended because he's a prideful guy, and he doesn't get that personal audience. But then on top of that, instead of being told something spectacular to do, he's told to simply go wash himself in the Jordan River. So he's offended on two counts. I'm not told anything spectacular to do, and I don't get a personal audience. So he leaves in a tiff, and then as he's going away, resisting the, the instructions that he's gotten in pride, his servants finally, finally, finally say, listen, just give it a try. Give it a try. And they persuade him to, to go on and dip himself in the water in order to be healed. And he was. Naaman did the, the simple and in some ways ordinary but unusual step and was healed. Now, the healing was important. The healing was great. But that really wasn't the big deal of that little story. The big deal was what Naaman said later in 1 Kings chapter 5. He said, now I know there's no God but the God of Israel. See, what humility does as we choose humility, as we choose to take strange steps in humility and believing God, is humility actually opens us up to meeting God for who he is, into that real encounter with God. I mean, we can go on in our religious games all our lives, but it's only when real humility comes into play that, that we have the potential to encounter God for who he is in the relational sense that he wants us meeting him. It's the way, again, that we, we escape anxiety. It's the way that we get on the, the path that God wants us on to do and be all that he wants us to be. Now, as I said, all of this background stuff is just to lay the foundation to encourage you and to remind me that we need to develop habits of humility. I mean, if 
if what I'm drawing out of Luke chapter 14 is right, if, if I'm reading 1 Peter chapter 5 correctly, if I'm, if I'm reading James, if I'm reading all over the New Testament and Old where humility is commanded and pride is warned against, I'm understanding that I need to consciously develop some habits of humility. That is, I need to learn how to choose to do humility in a way where it becomes the natural flow of life for me, where I do it unconsciously, whereas now I do pride unconsciously, where it's something that I learn to do in order for what? In order to be on the path towards the greatness, in order to be on the path towards the fulfillment of the purposes that God has for me, in order to escape from anxiety, in order to have that, that face-to-face meeting with God and in intimacy of relationship that he intends for us. So let's close out this morning by looking at some habits of humility that, that I hope you consider taking up. Uh, some of it will be like a test, maybe, of where you stand with humility. But let's look at them, 10 of them right now. Number one, number one, ask for feedback. Ask for feedback. The idea is make it a habit of humility to begin asking people for feedback, to ask people to critique, to be ready to receive criticism and to handle it well. It's why I'm purposely preaching a lousy sermon today, so that I can then ask you, give me some hard feedback and I can learn this habit of humility that comes as I take the hard stuff that comes back at me. But it's actually making it a habit to open yourselves up to that. And you know some of you where you are, you're unwilling to put yourself in that position where anybody can speak in and say anything that might crush your little ego because you want your self-esteem to stay puffed up. And the idea is no, it's it's developing a habit of humility that says, I want the feedback. I actually want the critique. I want the criticism. And I'm going to learn to be big enough to handle it. A habit. Number two. Number two. Confront your prejudices. Confront your prejudices. And this is what Jesus was talking about in the the dinner that he went to. I mean, the guy, the host, invited in people who were like him, people who were well-off financially, people who agreed with him theologically, people who were kind of on the same page, people who could do something for him. And what we need to do is develop the habit of confronting our prejudices and going in the opposite direction with people. (laughs) Actually taking a meal with people who might be Democrats or Republicans and we're of the opposite party. Really, doing that, stretching yourself. A- actually moving into a place where you're, you're not simply trying to meet up with people who can do something for you, but people who you can do something for. It's a humility that breaks the prejudices down in terms of, of race, in terms of theological persuasions, in terms of politics. And moving in and actually putting yourself in a place where you're, you're humble enough to think, maybe I've got something to learn. I mean, maybe you're you know, a, a staunch, doctrinally speaking, Armenian or Calvinist. You need to get together with somebody who's just crazy filled with the Holy Spirit and you know, doesn't care about all that. And if you're somebody who's crazy filled with the Holy Spirit and doesn't have your doctrine down, you need to get together with somebody who does understand their doctrine a bit better and kind of compare notes a little bit and get together on these things and understand humility is what's going to open the way to the fullness of what God has for us. Number three. Number three, start with a question. Again, simple, mundane habit. The idea is when you have your meetings this week, small groups, coffee, lunch, start with a question. Not a question about you. Not, you know, did these pants make my bottom look big? Not that kind of question. A question about the other person. A question to elicit something from the other person. The idea is to develop that habit a habit of humility that makes you, whether you're initially interested or not, develop an interest in other people. Number four, number four, really listen. Really listen. That means not listening until they keep quiet long enough for you to have an opening to say what you want to say, but really listening is an act of humility, thinking maybe I can learn something from them. Number five, admit mistakes and confess sins. Admit mistakes and confess sins. We make them all the time. Fess up early. It's humble and it's actually something that makes you look secure and strong. And so you want to do that, admitting mistakes and confessing sins to particular people. You don't confess all your sins to everybody, but to individuals and certainly to God. Number six, forgive. It's one of the habits of humility to develop, to forgive 
everybody, anybody, of anything. Again, with the humility that recognizes that what you've been forgiven of by God exceeds anything that you can forgive somebody else of. Humility acknowledges that. Number seven, seek mentors. Seek mentors. <laughs> no matter what your age is, there's always somebody around who knows more about you in some area. And the idea is to seek out people from whom you can learn and grow. It's a habit to develop that is humble, that again, puts us on the road to the greatness that God wants to see developed in our lives. Number eight, laugh at yourself. Entomologically, there's a connection between humor and humility. Have you ever looked at that? Humor and humility come from the same root. There's a connection there. In order for us to be humble, we've got to be able to laugh at ourselves. You are great material for jokes, and you need to be able to use that material on yourself regularly. It's, again, a habit, not, you know, not going over the top, but, but the ability to be a little bit self-deprecating is something that is a habit to develop that truly is one that moves towards greater humility. If you don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. Number nine, say no to self-pity. Say no, no, no to self-pity. It's an act of humility. You're getting more than you deserve. Whatever you're going, whatever happening with you in life, you're getting more than you deserve, right, Ron? Where else? <laughs> you're getting more than you deserve. We're getting more than we deserve. We deserve hell. We've got heaven. We've got a relationship with God. So self-pity is something, again, to grab hold of in terms of developing a habit to escape pride and to walk in humility. Number 10, number 10, pray. Pray. It's one of the greatest acts of humility where we say, we can't do it, God. We need you to do it with everything. Second Chronicles, Old Testament. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. And my people who are called by my, my name, when they humble themselves, when they humble themselves and pray and seek from their and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and forgive their sin, and will heal their land. You see the connection? Prayer and humility? Prayer is great, but humility is what empowers prayer to do what prayer is intended to do. And humility actually is going to be in place, usually at some level, before we're going to jump in and, and be praying in the first place. The idea is, to actually do humility, to actually understand that we need to do humility, to develop the habit of humility, and to become part of a culture of humility. A culture is made up of spontaneous, repeated patterns of behavior. Spontaneous, repeated patterns of behavior. And we want habits that develop a culture, a culture of humility, a culture of humility that that's free from anxiety, a culture of humility that meets God, a culture of humility that, that breaks through and sees God move in our midst with, with the supernatural intrusions that he wants to bring, but that pride often blocks. I mean, what we see, really, bottom line with this, is humility brings security, and pride, as long as we walk in it, simply evidences the degree of our insecurity that people walk in pride because they're insecure. That when you think about it, about yourself, about other people, think about how pride, the situations in which pride exhibits itself most commonly. And what's going on? Insecurity. It's only the humble. The humble who are secure enough in their identity before God. The humble who are secure enough in the purposes that God has for their life. The humble who are secure enough in knowing that they're living this life for an audience of one to just stack cliche on cliche. The humble who are secure enough to know that they're living this life under the mighty hand of God. And with that security, with that humility, with that faith, what happens? We see the supernatural breakthrough. We see God being able to use us to see his will done on earth as it is in heaven. And we are operating, again, under the code of conduct for the kingdom that releases God's power to work through us in a way in which he's the one who gets the glory, which he says it's all about. 
So we're going to have prayer up here in just a second. And I'd suggest that some of you um, need to be humble enough to come up and tell one of these prayer ministers to pray with you because you've never received Jesus as your Savior before and you want to confess him now as your Savior. That some of you need to come up and say, you know, I've never had anybody lay hands on me and pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit and be humble enough to take that strange step that insults your intelligence to have somebody pray for you to receive one of those strange gifts of the Holy Spirit that right this second don't make a whole lot of sense to you. To have somebody pray with you to break whatever barrier of pride keeps you in bondage right now from walking, stepping into the, the next step in the journey God has for you towards that, that ultimate purpose that he set out for your life. For everybody who needs prayer, sit tight. If you don't, after I pray, head out the door and leave room for those who do need the prayer. Father, thank you today for your amazing love, and I ask you, Holy Spirit, to move in power now as you just bring to our minds, to our hearts, those areas where we know we're in the bondage of pride, where we know we need to choose humility, do humility, pick up habits of humility. I ask you today, Father, to move in a power that clarifies our hearts and minds, to recognize where we are now, but also to be able to look into the future and see where you want us to go. I ask for you to move in power, Holy Spirit, as you bring that clarity, as you bring hope, as you bring that gift of of repentance, of an ability to change our minds, change our minds about what humility is, about the desirability of choosing it. We ask all of this in the power of Jesus Christ's name and ultimately, Father, for your glory. Amen.